All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Professor Alicia Hollins. I'm a professor in the politics department, and I'm joined today by Deborah Yashar and Mark Bessinger, who are also professors in the politics department. Um, we all study comparative politics in different regions of the world, so today's theme is going to be defending democracy, and we're going to draw on some of our expertise in Latin America and Russia to think about what's happening in the United States. But I want to start us off just thinking about what we're defending. Um, so there's a question of what democracy really is. And I want to spend a little time reflecting on that question and how that might also shape the ways that we mobilize in its defense. Um, so let me just start out getting us to think about what you guys think of as the core parts of democracy. So what I want you to do is just raise your hand if you think this is essential to classify a country as a democracy, to be a democracy. <clears throat> OK. First, elections are conducted without pervasive fraud or manipulation. You'll think that's essential. Wow. OK, great. Um, all votes have equal impact on election outcomes, essential to democracy. OK, a little less resounding, but still pretty essential. Government officials do not use public office for private gain. OK, also a lot of support. Um, government agencies are not used to monitor, attack, or punish political opponents. OK, can't get precise numbers here, but this is good. Elections are free from foreign influence. Wow, OK, lots of components essential to democracy. Um, one last one. Government leaders recognize the validity of bureaucratic or scientific consensus on matters of public policy. Government leaders recognize the validity of bureaucratic or scientific consensus about matters of public policy. Okay, less support, despite the fact today was organized by scientists, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, well, what I want to do with you is first share some results. This is part of what's known as the Bright Line Watch, which is a project done by um, political scientists at Yale and Cornell universities. And this was just surveying expert or professional political scientists about how they think of liberal democracy. So the Bright Line refers to the metaphorical Bright Line that distinguishes democracy from authoritarian systems. So I gave you a subset of the components that um, about 1,500 political scientists um, ranked on this survey that took place about a month ago. Just a couple of things to highlight. So as you'll see, the, the component with the most consensus is this idea that a democracy has to have free and fair elections. So almost every political scientist agrees on that fact. Um, second, there's a lot of consensus that democracies also need to have a system of checks and balances, so things like the judiciary and the legislature being able to control executive power. They also to have, need to have a certain set of civil liberties, so there's a lot of support for the idea that you need um, freedom of the press, um, that democracies do not punish their opponents. Perhaps there's a little less consensus for what we think of as some of the softer elements of democracy. So that last question on, do you need to respect scientists? Um, there are a whole set of questions about, um, you know, should majorities exercise restraint and reciprocity? Many people think that these are beneficial to democracies, but perhaps not essential. Okay, now the second part of this exercise is trying to evaluate American democracy. How do we know if we've ever passed that bright line or if we're headed toward it? So I just want to repeat that same exercise we just did. But I now want you to, to respond and raise your hand if you think that the US mostly or fully meets the standard. OK? So does the US today fully or mostly meet the standard that elections are conducted without pervasive fraud or manipulation? Raise your hand. All right, so the U.S. is, despite President Trump's claims of massive fraud, I think we're doing pretty well on that dimension. All votes have equal impact on election outcomes. Does the U.S. fully or partly meet that standard? Okay, 
Yeah, not much support for that. So things like the Electoral College perhaps do change the value of a vote. Um, government officials do not use public office for private gain. Does the U.S. fully or partly meet that standard? You guys are harsh critics. Okay. All right. Government agencies are not used to monitor, attack, or punish political opponents. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we still haven't locked her up yet. Um, elections are free from foreign influence. Okay, Russia has come. Government leaders recognize the validity of bureaucratic or scientific consensus about matters of public policy. How are we doing? Not so well. Okay, lots of scientists in the room, perhaps. All right, so I just want to share with you the evaluations, again, coming from this survey of about 1,500 political scientists, which is grading democracy in the United States. Um, so I think they were actually a little more optimistic than many of you in this room. Um, but you can see that most people do think that the United States does have free and fair elections. So to the extent we take a very minimalist definition of democracy, the United States is doing pretty well on that count. Um, some of the things about legislative checks, judicial power to check the executive, again, we see the United States actually having pretty strong institutions, according to this professional survey of political scientists, survey of professional political scientists. Um, but as many of you recognize, there are real structural deficits in American democracy. So the U.S. does quite poorly on the questions about um, equal voting rights, um, votes having equal impact. Now, some of those always, um, certainly predate President Trump, so things like the Electoral College, gerrymandering, voter registration laws. Um, those are things that have been happening for the past decades, and perhaps the Democratic Party has been asleep at the wheel. Perhaps those are structural constraints that are hard to change. Then there's some other red flags that really have come up in this past election. So, obviously, foreign interference in elections, that's relatively new, I would say, in terms of a threat to democracy. Concerns about the use of public office for private gain arguably have dramatically increased. Um, and also, I think some of those softer aspects of democracy that we just talked about have really been compromised, um, especially in the light of the most recent Twitter accusations against President Obama. Um, many political scientists think that informal norms, informal rules of the game, are part of what sustains democracy. So politicians need to recognize the right of the opposition party to exist, to criticize the government. Um, and this is one of the things that perhaps has changed most. Um, so one thing that I love is this letter that um, President H.W. Bush wrote to Obama upon his inauguration. And Bush goes through this idea that, you know, being president is extremely hard, but Obama's going to be supported by his family, by God. And then he says also, a country that is pulling for you, including me. So this is part of a political culture in which our politicians, despite their partisan disagreements, can agree that they're all trying to work for some vision of improving the country and also are able to cooperate and support each other in that vision. So that's one aspect that I think has really been challenged. Um, I want to turn a little bit and talk about my experience in Venezuela before turning it over to Professors Yashar and Bessinger, who are going to talk a little bit more about different country experiences. Um, so to do that, I want to ask you guys, are there any elements in this kind of laundry list of democracy that you think are missing? Are there any things that are not up there? Yeah. Okay. All right. So some, what do you say, like participation? Or what do you mean by how far it should go? Uh-huh. Okay. Some more direct notions of democracy. Anything else that's missing? Yeah. Okay. Equal access to information. Support to, yep. Wealth inequality. Okay. Anything else that's missing? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so along with access to information, you need to be informed and educated. Anything else that we're missing up here? Privacy, okay. Certainly in information age, that's challenged. Anything else? Okay. Those are all great aspects to add to this question of what is democracy. One of the things that I notice looking at this list is it's very much a conception of liberal democracy, where what we are looking at are the institutional checks on executive authority, and also the sort of formal aspects of participating. In Latin America, one of the biggest debates, and I used to work in Venezuela, so a lot of this is coming out of my experience there, has been over um, notions of majoritarian democracy or the actual outcomes of democracy and these liberal checks and balances. So a president like Hugo Chavez came to power basically saying that he was going to institute a more true version of democracy. Finally, people who had been neglected by the political system were going to be able to see policies that really impacted their lives. So Hugo Chavez is often thought of as a populist in the sense he was an outsider politician. He attacked a lot of traditional institutions. And what he did was really attack a lot of these liberal institutions, the judiciary, the media. All of this was seen as part of an elite set of institutions that did little for ordinary Venezuelans. He was claiming to restore true democracy, which meant feeding the poor. It meant ideas of equality that someone mentioned. That can create a real tension in conceptions of democracy. Many populists, and I would put Trump in this category, use the idea of restoring um, rule by the people, or what can be thought of as a majoritarian sense of democracy, in order to undercut these liberal institutions of democracy. Now, Venezuela is not a case that ends well. Um, <laughs> the opposition spent a lot of time writing about the importance of these individual rights, writing about the importance of freedom of the press, the right to organize, etc. And those really fell on deaf ears because to many ordinary Venezuelans, freedom of the press does not feed you, does not create a more equal society. As I reflect on that experience, one big difference in the United States from Venezuela is that these liberal institutions, many of them do have a much deeper tradition. They have a much stronger, um, a higher level of public support. That can be used to the advantage as we try to mobilize for their protection. But nonetheless, to a lot of ordinary Americans, it's not always clear how this results in policies that are going to improve their lives. One of the things that um, I take away also from a lot of academic research is that many times when we're trying to defend liberal democracy as liberals, our intuition is to say, well, this is all about the protection of individual rights. This is about social equality. But sometimes those arguments aren't the most persuasive to conservatives, to those who are trying to bring over to the side of really seeing their importance. Um, many times values like tradition, patriotism, are essential to actually convincing those who don't think like us, who might prioritize the policy outcomes over individual rights. So one of the things that I think we should reflect on is in trying to defend these liberal institutions against a different vision of democracy, how can we convince people that these are central to their lives, to their everyday well-being? And also, how can liberals start talking more about values that could bring other people on their side? I think of these values as things like bringing up the Constitution. This is part of a historical tradition. And this is part of what it means to be American. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over for a little bit more commentary from Professor Yasha and Mr. Well, it's great to see everybody. I wish the circumstances were otherwise and we didn't have to have this conversation, but given that we do need to have this conversation, I'm really pleased and encouraged by, um, by the turnout. So thank you all for coming and thank you, uh, Alicia, for kicking off um, this conversation. Um, I wanted to just start off um, by 
Bouncing off a little bit from what Alicia said, I have to say a lot of my comments dovetailed a little bit with hers, but I'll, I'll act on the fly here, which is that oftentimes in the political science literature, when we talk about democracy and we talk about democracies that have been instantiated, that are consolidated, it's oftentimes referred to as the only game in town, the sense that it is the only regime that makes sense, it's the only regime that people will support. Putting aside this very important question that was raised about whether or not you support the liberal institutions or more aspirational hope for the socioeconomic outcomes you hope it will achieve. But as a political scientist who doesn't work on the United States, who's worked on Latin America and has looked at other regions, and looking at a more historical perspective, it is of course important to remember that democracy outside of the United States has of course witnessed waves, waves of democratization, waves of democratic breakdown. So of course many of us are thinking about Europe in the interwar period in the 20th century when through electoral means, democratic regimes, though restricted, also witnessed this kind of backsliding that, um, that was just mentioned in the earlier um, presentation. In Latin America, similarly in the 1960s and the 1970s, this period of democratization throughout the region witnessed not the slow erosion um, of, uh, of electoral institutions, but in fact military coups that initiated quite brutal and repressive uh, authoritarian rule. And of course now we're in this period of the third wave of democracy, which throughout the region we've seen a transition at least to some of these liberal democratic institutions, but also now thinking about, given the democracies we have on the ground, What's the quality of those democracies and what are the threats to them? So much of the debate, at least in the Latin American literature, is about the quality of the democracies that we have in place, and in particular this very famous phrase by O'Donnell about the low intensity citizenship that individuals can experience even if they have these liberal democratic institutions in place. In some places, moreover, there have been efforts by executives not just to slowly erode, but actually to shut down legislatures. So in the 90s, the classic case in Latin America was uh, Peru, but my friend Nancy Bermeo has noted that this also occurred in Armenia, Belarus, Zambia, and <coughs> Haiti, efforts by an executive to actually shut down the legislature, and it should be noted, sometimes with support of the population. That was sort of the striking thing about Peru. And third, this challenge to democracy most recently has witnessed backsliding, which is the term that kind of encompasses some of these elements that Alicia was referring to, this sense of a slow erosion, a challenge to the very liberal institutions that we oftentimes um, associate with uh, uh, democratic institutions today. I should note that in a recent study by Nancy Bermeo, she highlighted that in this contemporary period, in the um, in the most recent decade, it's important to note that the challenges to democracy really fall on the first and the third dimension. The quality of the experience, this low intensity citizenship, along with a slow erosion of backsliding, this sort of threat of coups, while very significant during the 60s and early 70s, has really witnessed a decline both in, a, in attempts and in efforts. Okay, so we have this long history. Most of the world has not looked at democracy as the only game in town. Democracy is in place, but still there's this challenge in, of deepening the democracy and also trying to guard the institutions that are in place. However, there's another element that um, uh, Alicia Holland brought in that I want to pull out, which is the role of populism in the democracies that are uh, in place. So Alicia noted, and again I want to reiterate, that the backsliding that we've seen in democracies might entail restrictions on the press, restrictions of civil liberties, attacks on opponents, accumulation of executive power or aggrandizement. Um, in other words, not a clear breakdown, but an effort to slowly constrain those rights. But in Latin America and some other places, and I would submit to you including in the United States and parts of Europe, this has now coincided with the rise of populism. One of these terms, really we have no idea what it means, everybody uses it, it's used very loosely, but let me tell you how it's oftentimes used, at least in the Latin American context. In Latin America, populism tends to emerge in moments of economic crisis or social dislocation, so people feel quite um, unmoored, unanchored in the context in which they live. And what happens? Populism refers to the emergence of a leader who tries to create a very, very special set of ties and bonds with the population that feels dislocated, that feels economically marginalized. How do they do so? They do so through 
by sidelining what are oftentimes seen as meddlesome parties, so the very political institutions of representation are belittled, and there's an effort by the leader to create very direct ties to, uh, to the citizenry. That, that leader, in turn, attempts to develop a very deep loyalty, oftentimes using a messianic discourse, oftentimes saying they are the only people who can resolve the problem, and in fact that this heterogeneous set of masses should be tied to them. In Argentina, the phrase that was oftentimes used was the descansados, the poor, who couldn't even wear, have shirts on their back, that Perón was going to step forth and be their leader, be their savior, and be able to uh, arrive at a, a better solution. In other words, there's an effort to create vertical accountability between the masses and between the leader while sidestepping institutions and sidestepping political parties. But there's a second element of populism that emerges, which is a challenge and attack on what is referred to as horizontal accountability, the very checks and balances that Alicia was referring to earlier, which is to attack entrenched political elites, to attack institutions as not being fair, um, fair and faithful to their, um, to their efforts. In other words, to, do, to engage in the very kinds of backsliding that uh, Alicia Holland laid out for us. Okay, so this is a Latin American phenomenon. It was oftentimes seen as a progressive phenomenon on behalf of workers who had previously not had rights to unionize, to have a, a good and fair wage and the like. But it can also be used um, by uh, people who don't fall on the left, and I would submit to you that's sort of the phenomenon that we see occurring, particularly in the United States. I see Trump as very much falling within this line of a populist, although not necessarily a populist of the left. We see this emerging on the right. And it's a populism, I would submit, that is particularly defined by xenophobia and a concern about closing borders, about keeping out immigrants, so taking care of our own, while also making sure that others, quote unquote, are not polluting that very situation. It is moreover occurring in a system of, of cutting back on checks and balances. So Dan Zablat and Steve Levitsky have a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times in December that uses the political science literature to talk about the ways in which Trump is not only a populist, but engaging in this backsliding. And let me just note one other New York Times article that I would encourage you to look at, which is an article entitled, Just How Abnormal Is the Trump Presidency? Okay, that's uh, sort of a leading question when you know where the authors are gonna go. <laughs> but what it does is it provides a two by two where on one, on one dimension it shows how important the questions are, and another, it shows how abnormal the actions are that are being taken in the current period. And you can see in this current period, they highlight that there is an incredible number of abnormally, abnormal, in other words, unusual compared to previous presidents, actions that are quite important in scale. So the use of information, questionable constitutionality, changing the composition of the National Security Council, criticizing other branches of government and agencies, and of course, the reported ties to Russia that um, I'm sure Mark Feisinger will talk about uh, in his presentation. All right, so there, no, he won't. All right, so there is a lot to take note of. I would submit to you, and I suspect given the numbers in this room, there's a lot to be concerned about. All right, so what can we do about it? I really wish I had a silver bullet, but let me just mention a few things um, that I would, that come out of the political science and sociology literature. The first is, obviously, mobilization matters. It's important for the population not to be apathetic, not to see this as normal and impossible to attack. It's important to mobilize. And it's important to mobilize in the context of trying to get allies with the elite. That's oftentimes the argument about movements to democratization and trying to defend against the attack on democracy. However, it would be really naive to say that mobilization alone will result in these outcomes. Mobilization can be used for all kinds of ends. In fact, Sherry Berman, who used to be a professor here, would note that Germany, during the Weimar Republic, had a very actively organized civil society, very organized, lots of organizations that were in place. What it didn't have were political parties that could tap into them. And in that context, it's the situation in which the Nazis were able to mobilize civil society towards other ends. So what does she highlight? Mobilization in the context of very strong political parties, the very things that po populists tried to sideline, is critical. So mobilize in civil society, but don't sideline the political institutions of representation. Those have to be critical. Otherwise, those civil society uh, organizations can be used not just for good, but also for ill. <laughs> 
Second, mobilization needs to be tied to organizing. Theda Scotchpole has written quite a lot in recent years about the importance, again, of not just mobilizing, but actually having a structured organization that works both at the local level and tries to scale up. So she analyzed this in the context of the Tea Party. Those of you who've read The Indivisible Guide will see that this is very much tied to those arguments of, yes, mobilize in the streets, go to DC, engage in strikes, do all the things that many of us in the room might consider doing, but it has to be organized. It has to be organized across organizations. It has to be organized at the local and the national level in order to coordinate and to compete across sectors. Moreover, strategy is critical here, and if political scientists have one thing to say that we can mostly agree on, otherwise we're a field that disagrees quite a lot, is that political scientists care, I mean, elected officials care about many things, but perhaps most preeminently, they care about getting reelected. If that's the case, an organization means that it's important to target elected officials, not just the president, not just to focus on the person um, at the executive level, but to focus on those who are running for re-election, again, at the local, state, and national level. Politicians want to get re-elected, so why not use that to our, to our advantage, and that's what the Indivisible God would note. Third, organizations do best when they're tied to already existent civil society organizations. So people who have looked at mobilizations against military rule in other places and the efforts to mobilize in other contexts have noted that oftentimes if you tap into soccer clubs, music groups, reading groups, in other, in other words, places where people already have an affinity, have a trust, they like going there, they want to go there in addition to having maybe shared sets of values, that can actually serve a purpose for bringing people together in the long term. And then the last um, Two points I'll note here on this, on this is the importance of ideas. So Alicia highlighted the importance of thinking about not just a political goal, but the values that would bring people together. Norms matter. Sherry, uh, Sherry Berman has talked about the importance of social solidarity and a sense of national purpose. Those were some of the things that were just referred to. Danny Roderick has noted similar things in a recent piece. There have to be norms, not just big ideas. Okay, last thing I'll note, and then I'll just end with a couple of questions or three questions, is that it's really important not to just speak to like-minded people. It's important to think of tapping into groups that you might not agree with because it's heterogeneous coalitions that are the most powerful. So the democratization literature always highlights the importance of creating ties with a divided elite. To presume that you might actually be able to engage in what's seen as loyalty shifts by getting people to join your force, your side, by focusing on what is critical. So if you think about South Africa, how did that happen? That partially happened through the divestment strategy that got elites to change sides to realize that they wouldn't support apartheid. In Latin America, similarly, efforts to engage in backsliding oftentimes was able to create alliances with elites who withdrew their support from a regime. Those kinds of loyalty shifts and heterogeneous coalitions are critical. All right. So let me just end with a few questions. I'll turn it over to Mark, which is there's obviously so much to say, and we've kind of skated over many questions, but we're in a university setting. So I submit to you the following questions. What is our role as scholars, as people who produce knowledge to try to convey information, try to generate critical thought? How do we come up with meaningful analysis and proposals in a world where alternative facts are actually taken for granted? in the current context? How do you balance social media as a mobilizational tool when it can also be used as a mobilizational attack, as an effort to diffuse at the same time as it can generate a broader conversation? And finally, how do we think about freedom of thought and expression in a context where people are using that very same set of basic guiding principles that were in that Bright Lines survey, using that to actually engage in uh, conversation that are seen as being anti-democratic and exclusionary. Our role as scholars, our ability to think about information, and our ability to think about freedom of thought and expression, I would submit that we as members of this university and this community need to think really critically and hard about what is a really difficult situation. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Mark.
Okay, my take I think might be a little darker than uh, what the Bright Line uh, survey showed and uh, some of the other things. So um, let me also thank Alicia for organizing this session. I think that there are questions today about whether we actually do live in a democracy at this point in time. And political scientists have termed a coin, okay, so term, termed a, a, uh, uh, a notion uh, called competitive authoritarianism. And competitive authoritarianism refers to societies that are ruled by authoritarian leaders, uh, but that still have some degree of pluralism. Uh, such regimes uh, hold elections, uh, but those elections are not completely free and fair. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the, in some ways, the alternative face to democracy is this notion of competitive authoritarianism. And I would submit that we kind of, at this point in time in our history, um, you know, sit at the edge between democracy and competitive authoritarianism. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at our president uh, and many of the legislature, legislators have been elected by uh, means that are not entirely free and fair, uh, you know, as a result of rampant gerrymandering and disenfranchisement of lots of voters and unrestricted money in politics and, of course, uh, foreign interference uh, in our electoral process. The executive branch uh, and uh, the legislature are controlled by a single party, uh, and that party refuses to hold the executive branch accountable pretty much for any of its actions. So there is no constraint, uh, institutional constraint, coming from the legislature uh, on the presidency, or very little. Uh, the presidency itself, as we know, is thoroughly corrupted. Uh, it's benefiting uh, the president's family, uh, benefiting the president uh, directly, uh, and at the same time, the president is attacking the remaining uh, institutions of, of democracy, freedom of the press, uh, the courts, uh, and so on. Now, I'm not saying that we are a competitive authoritarian system, but I am saying that the alternative to democracy is some form of competitive authoritarianism, and we stand at a crossroads uh, in this country, a crossroads that we have to consider. I think there's a belief among many that the institutions of democracy are strong and they will prevent any slide in competitive authoritarianism. I wrote a piece, uh, an op-ed piece, uh, published in a blog, uh, with Valerie Bunce of Cornell University, uh, which is entitled Taking Democracy um, uh, taking democracy for granted. And essentially that piece goes through what happened in Eastern Europe um, and the decline of democracy in Eastern Europe. Everybody thought that that was, or, or I should say liberals thought, that that was impossible. That they had institutions that were there to guarantee things. The courts, legislature, rule of law, and so on. Uh, well, that was not exactly true. And it's very easy, I think, to corrupt those institutions. They can go very quickly, um, and uh, so you should not be, sh should not uh, take things for granted. So, uh, as was alluded to before, I do study Russia, um, and that's one of the areas that I work on. Uh, I'm, I will talk about Russia in passing, but not so much directly, uh, and certainly not directly about the current scandal uh, you know, concerning Russia. Uh, but I also um, research and teach about social movements. And so, uh, and, and one of the things I also work on is what I call urban civic revolts. Uh, these are revolts that have occurred around the world, uh, which are meant to reclaim the public sphere from corrupt uh, and abusive governments. And so I think, uh, you know, that there is some insight that we can gain about, uh, you know, what others have done around the world in order to reclaim uh, the public sphere, to reclaim democracy. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to focus on uh, in my remarks, since this is a day of action, uh, essentially, uh, what I want to look at are um, how do we, how, how, you know, what kinds of things uh, should we do to remedy our situation? How does the current situation line up with those things? So there are certain uh, similarities to successful uh, movements around the world. Uh, they generally need uh, a, uh, uh, resources, you know, such as people and skills uh, and places to hold meeting, meetings and money and other things like that. Uh, they also need what Charles Tilley called WUNC, W-U-N-C, uh, which is his acronym for 
uh, worthiness, uh, unity, uh, numbers, and commitment, uh, the qualities of successful movements. Uh, I would say so far, of uh, what we've seen in the United States um, in the opposition to what's been happening here, uh, has been strong in terms of worthiness and strong in terms of numbers, but relatively weak in terms of unity and commitment. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it's one thing to call up your congressman and, and dial the phone. Uh, I do five calls every day uh, and do that. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's uh, one thing to give money uh, to a particular organization. It's pretty easy, just press a button. When we look at the experience around the world, uh, to defend democracy requires more than that. Uh, it often requires acts of bravery. It requires acts of sacrifice and commitment. Um, and I think that we have not yet seen that. Uh, we don't know whether we have that commitment uh, at this point in time. Uh, I would also say that, um, that we tend to be relatively lacking in unity. Uh, in the sense that we have many, many organizations that are involved in challenging uh, the current administration, uh, the current situation, uh, but they are very scattered, and there is no uh, unification of their actions. And uh, so that's a, a major problem. So, uh, you know, we should have no illusions uh, about uh, what it takes to evict a budding authoritarian regime uh, or forcing it back into the democratic corner. It is difficult. Uh, it is dangerous often, dangerous business. Uh, it often takes iterative attempts to succeed. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, successful um, uh, movements around the world that have, have done it, they often fail. Uh, at first, and learn lessons. They learn lessons from their failures, uh, and then apply those lessons to the next time around. Uh, it is not uh, an easy thing. Uh, and I think we need to reflect upon two uh, things in particular that make it easier, uh, make it easier to win. One is uh, what uh, political scientists call political opportunities, and the other uh, is the need to engage in more deliberate and focused uh, action. And Deborah was alluding to this uh, before as well. So we know from experience around the world that political activism is profoundly shaped by the weaknesses, the weaknesses of the targets against which it mobilizes. Uh, exerting leverage over an undemocratic government, while always difficult, uh, is made a great deal easier uh, when movements attack the specific vulnerabilities uh, of those governments. And all governments, don't be mistaken, all governments have vulnerabilities. Some of those vulnerabilities inhere in the very nature of the institutions uh, and how they are constructed. This is what political scientists call static political opportunities. Uh, the textbook example of static political opportunities comes from environmental movements in Europe uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, environmental movements in Sweden, uh, because of the relative openness of the, uh, of, of the Swedish political system, had a much easier time uh, influencing policy there than was the case in Germany or in France. Uh, in the context of the struggle to reclaim democracy here in the United States, the U.S. Dis displays a number of static political opportunities uh, that have traditionally shaped activism here. Uh, one, of course, is the court system. And the court system uh, has played a critical role in movements in the United States throughout the history of social movements. Uh, particularly the civil rights movement played a very important role there. Uh, another uh, is uh, the federalism and, uh, and, and uh, our media system, both of which uh, fragment the political sphere in some ways and make it easier for challengers uh, to uh, move into political space. Uh, and then we have divisions within our legislature, which also, of course, need to be taken advantage of. Uh, we have set laws about impeachment, for instance, uh, a process that is there uh, that can be taken advantage of. These are the kinds of static political opportunities that we need to think about uh, or need to be thought about uh, in a very serious way. But there's also another class of political opportunities, and that's what... Um,